It's a great honor and privilege to get to preach to you this morning. If you don't know me, I, I grew up here at this church, and, and um, I get to work on staff here at the church. I'm over the children's ministries and, and uh, various things around here and the, uh, with the buses and, and different things, but, um, but to preach is, is always an exciting thing. I'm not a polished preacher, and so I get very nervous of, um, when I preach to a crowd that I'm not used to preaching to. When I preach to the kids, oh, that's easy. I, I enjoy that. When I preach on my bus, that's easy. I, I enjoy that. Um, uh, but today, I'd like to show you, or just take you to uh, just some thoughts that kind of go along with the theme of February being, I love my church. And, uh, and why, why do I love my church and what's so special about this church? And, and anyway, so um, Matthew t- chapter 13, if you wouldn't mind, let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 13, if you look at verse 45, we're talking about the, well, let, let me, let's, let's just read it here. Um, it says, verse 45, again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. When he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. This parable here can be applied to a lot of different things. uh, And and I wouldn't argue with anybody who thinks it's, it's something specific, but I would like to just take the principle here today of, of what's happening in this parable. You've got a merchant who's seeking goodly pearls, and when he finds one, it's a game changer. And he says, I'm going to sell all that I have for this one pearl. And my question for the merchant in this story is, what's so special about this pearl? What would get you to do what you did to get this pearl? And we'll talk about that a little bit today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all of the, the nuggets of truth, just the, the gold that's, that's buried in your word uh, that uh, can be there even though we've read it over and over again. And then your Holy Spirit just uh, points something out and, and applies something to our life. And, and uh, your word is a living word and uh, inspired uh, your spirit is in this word and and it's living and and it shows us how we're supposed to live and it's it's got new truth for us every single day and every time we go to it and what an awesome book that you've given us lord i pray that you help this to uh, apply to us and help it to help us throughout our week lord and um i i want to brag on our church a little bit today lord but help me not to sound arrogant when i speak and um, uh, but I truly believe, Lord, that, that we don't hold a high enough value on the church that you paid for with your blood. And so I pray, Lord, that you help us to have a, a, a little bit higher value in our mind over what this church is uh, when we're done here today. In your name I pray. Amen. This story about the pearl is pretty neat that God chose the pearl to talk about in this story because there's lots of other gems that we're real familiar with. But the pearl is one of the only gems that, um, that is it's formed inside of a living organism. And, uh, and it's, it's formed by maybe an, an oyster or a mussel or something that, uh, that uh, lives in the muck and the mire of the bottom of the sea. Uh, down in the bottom of the ocean where it's dirty and yucky. And, and that pearl starts forming inside of that organism when a grain of sand or maybe a parasite or something gets into the shell and starts to hurt the flesh of that organism. And then because of that, uh, that oyster or mussel or whatever it is starts to, to slowly secrete the pearl's materials around that intrusion and starts to surround and protect the wound. Uh, and that's how a pearl is formed. And the longer that it, it keeps building, it, the, the larger the pearl gets. And, uh, and then in the Bible days, a diver would go diving down looking for pearls and he would find that oyster and, and he'd pick it up uh, out of the dirt and it's kind of hard to find them down there sometimes but he'd pick it up out of the dirt and then he would he would break it open 
Uh, today, it's all trying to be environmentally friendly, so they've got little scaffold things that go in there to pull out the pearls. But, but uh, back then, it would, they would break it open, and, and by breaking it open, it would tear that muscle open, and that, that oyster would no longer uh, con- be able to continue to live for very long. And, uh, and then he would take that pearl out, so he'd break it open. The, the oyster, it would die, and he would take that pearl, and then that pearl would, have, would begin its life of value. He would bring it up to the surface, and then it would be avail- It would be okay to sell, and it would. It all depended on the shape of it and the size of it d- determined its value. and And uh, pearls are a pretty incredible, in- incredible thing. I've got I've got some pearls here today. I borrowed these from my wife. Uh, I got some pearls. These ones came from the Philippines. These are Filipino pearls right here, and uh, these ones I think these are fake. But uh, but <laughs> but we got some pearls. All right, pearls are. Uh, they are in a, a, a neat gem that hold a lot of value, and uh, I've got another pearl here. This is this is a ping pong ball, but this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be our pearl of great price. This is it. This is uh, this would be a huge pearl. Uh, the largest pearl is not quite the size. It's more the size of a large marble, um, and it's worth millions of dollars. The the uh, a pearl this size. This would be an incredibly great priced pearl and but God used this story to explain some things and when you start looking at the similarities of a pearl to the church it's a pretty incredible similarity it's a pretty incredible comparison because the church was formed by our living savior who came down here to live a perfect life to show us the example and to it it, it was formed by a living organism and then Jesus had to come down to the muck and the mire of this sin sick disgusting world compared to his holy heaven and he came down here and this is where he wanted to start his church this was important to him and then the church began with a wound that happened in his flesh. He had to be hurt inside of his flesh for the church to be formed. He had to be bruised for our iniquities and by his stripes we have been healed and and it was it was by his shedding of his blood in the most gruesome way that we could imagine is how the church was purchased. Acts 20:28 20, says that the church of God is that which he hath purchased with his own blood. I don't know about you. Well, I know about you. None of us have purchased something with all of our blood. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. (laughs) But better yet, none of us have purchased something with all of our son's blood. If, If you had, then whatever you had purchased like that would hold an incredible value to you that words just could not describe. And the thing that would bring you closer to somebody else is if they just tried to glimpse and try to relate a little bit to how much value you hold on what was purchased. The amazing thing that I see in this story is just how somehow the merchant in this story saw the value of this pearl enough to make a huge change in his life now this merchant can be described as christ and many would describe it that way and i i think that's a that's a great comparison but i would also like to compare this to you and me and i'll explain that in a little bit but one day can you hear god say that the church you gave your love to that you spent your time on that you uh, spent this morning getting uh, a, a whole uh, slew of kids ready and dressed and trying to get them breakfast fed and all before nine o'clock whoa that is early and uh, all, all of the effort that you did to get off work to be here today all of the uh, all of the time and preparation that some of you teachers put into the Sunday school lesson that you taught to the kids up the hill um, all of the time that was spent on the, the special music and the learning of the piano and, and, uh, and everything of that, that got put into what happened today. Can you see yourself standing before God and, and he's saying that church that you loved and that church that you invested in, that you gave your money and your time to is more precious to me than you could possibly know because my son was the one who formed the, that church. 
It was through his world wounds that that pearl of a church was formed. It's a pretty incredible thing. Now, if you would, turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 5. But, oh, please hold your place in Matthew 13 if you haven't lost it. We're coming back to Matthew 13. I've got some more com comparisons to do there. But Ephesians chapter 5, I love my church. That's the theme of my message here today. Uh, the title of my message is, What's So Special About This Pearl? But I love my church, and my church holds a great value to me just growing up here, but I do not love my church as much as Jesus loves my church. Across America, too many of us only love the church for surface level reasons. It's just, what can the church do for me? How beautiful is the property? How nice is the light show? How good does the, the, the music sound? And how does it make me feel on the inside? And how can I go and just, just get the best feeling I can on a Sunday morning? And that's the surface level love most of America has for church. I have a lot of surface level reasons I love my church and surface level reasons are a great reason to love or starting reason to love something. I grew up here and I could take you around this property and really just walk from place to place and I could think through just memories and stories to tell you about all over this place because because I've gotten to do so many incredible things here. Um, I've gotten the full experience of growing up here. I've have a I grew up in a home that just bought in and decided we're going to take it, the Bible for what it says and we're going to raise our home uh, the way it's preached from this pulpit and uh, we're going to have unity between the home and the church and I got the full experience of, of growing up here and so I love this place. Uh, this, is, this is my home church. And uh, I mean, just uh, from all of the, the teen activities that we've done and all of the crazy contests we've done in junior church and, you know, a paintball down in the field and airsoft up in the building and, and, uh, and dodgeball and, and uh, getting to learn sports, football and basketball and got to uh, learn um, uh, mixed martial arts here. I mean, it just there's so much packaged into this church that when I think back on my life, like, man, I love this church. But all of those reasons are pretty surface level reasons and if I only love my church for surface level reasons then I could name you several times where petty surface level things could have changed my love for this church into something else this church is where I got my wife and I'm thankful for my wife I love that about, about this church and I love my wife but I do not love my wife as much as Jesus loves the church even though I'm commanded to I have lots of surface level reasons to love my wife. I won't get into all of them. I love her hair. I love the color of her eyes. I love the sound of her voice. But if my love for her was only surface level, our marriage wouldn't be very successful. Because when her surface level attraction does not match my self-centered feelings, that love, that then my love for her will die because I only have a surface level love. A biblical love is so much more. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be a holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord loved the church. He gave. Jesus gives us an example of how much we should love our wives by showing us how much he loves the church. He gave. He gave up his throne for a manger. He gave up his kingdom for this yucky world. He gave up a perfect dwelling for a sin-filled dwelling. He gave up his position where all of the angels and all the cherubims and seraphims bowed before him crying, holy, holy, holy. And he came down to this earth and started washing disciples' feet. He came down as a lowly servant 
He gave up a lot of stuff to show us. He gave up perfection to come and live in pain. And he did it to be touched with our infirmities because he wanted to show us that he knows how you feel today. He knows it to the fullest extent, your feelings. And he did that. He gave up who he was so that way he could love the church. He could love you. If we're supposed to love our wives like Christ loved the church, then we husbands must be willing to give up our laziness, maybe to serve around the house. Maybe we need to give up watching the whole football game because we need to do some dishes to help our wife. We've got to be able to give up uh, the, the hobbies that, that, uh, that wrap up our lives. You know, the, 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 we go out and we play golf, but, but we don't spend any extra time. And, and, and there's got to be a balance there. And you've got to look at, say, am I showing love to my wife and just telling her that you love her is not enough? The only way to show biblical love to your wife is to be giving of yourself, to be giving up of things that are valuable to you because loving her and giving of yourself to her is more valuable to her and to God. If we're supposed to follow Christ's example in loving the church, then we need to be willing to give to the church in a biblical love. And I'm not just talking about money. Money's a great thing. But a church, we've got to be willing to give of our time to the church. Being here on Sunday morning might be a, a huge step for you, and I'm, I'm glad for you, but maybe you've been coming Sunday mornings for a while now. Maybe it's time that you've got to give up some more love to the church. To the church, remember, I'm not saying Faith Baptist Church is all that. I'm saying to the church that Jesus purchased with his blood, and Faith Baptist Church makes up that church. And so we, have as Christians, if we want to love like Christ loves, then we've got to be willing to give up of our time to the church. Our time is so short. Our time is described as a vapor that appeareth for a little and vanisheth away. We've only got so much time to give. Are we giving any of it, uh, enough of it, to the church? Are we giving attention to the church? And we're thinking about the church. How can I help my church? How how can I serve in my church? How can I make it better? We're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's how those things, uh, the blessings of God get added to us. What about our money? Is, the tr is where our treasure is, there is our heart also. Is our money, are, are, are we giving any money to the church? Or are we giving it all to McDonald's and giving it all to Starbucks and giving it all to the gas company that I mentioned earlier? Are we, what are we doing with our money? Are we giving it to the thing that Christ loves? Maybe it's our talents. Maybe it's the things that, that we are good at. Maybe you're a great decorator, and, or maybe you, are, uh, uh, you can mow some lawns or, or do some maintenance or just show up and be a, a living body here on Saturday Soul Winning. You don't have to say anything. You just got to be here. And, uh, and that, that's, that's a huge step. Uh, it, what are we giving up? So I want to challenge you to biblically love this church not because it's made up of perfect holy people but because we're a bunch of pathetically imperfect people trying our best to please a perfect god i want to challenge you to love this church not because the preacher tells you to love this church not but because god has written in his word and he tells us that if we want to be a successful growing christian then we need a church that believes god's word we need a church that preaches god's word and that tries its best to live by god God's word. I want to challenge you to love this church, not for what it can do for you, but what you can do for God through this church. And the awesome part about that is in return, you'll find that everything you do for God will be returned to your benefit multiplied times over. I want to challenge you to love this church, not just because it pleases you, but because it provides a place where you can serve and please God. I love this church for a lot of surface pleasing reasons, but I love this church most because I truly believe that when God looks down at our church, he sees a group of sincere people with hearts of little children looking up to our father and into his word, 
us, crying, show us what we can do to please you and we'll just do it. We are definitely not a perfect church. And I don't believe we're perfect, but God does give us a command to be ye holy as I am holy. We're commanded to be perfect. That's a hard command. You know, growing up here, my, my dad, if you know Mr. Peterson in the back back there, uh, he, as I grew up, do you know he expected me to be perfect? At least that's what it seemed like. <laughs> he was training me and he wanted me to be perfect. But when I would fail at being what he was training me to be, that did not determine whether he was pleased with me. What truly pleased him as a father was when I wanted to be and do what he had been training me to do out of a desire to please him. And his pleasure as a father was not the reason he expected my obedience. He expected my obedience because ultimately down the road, I would realize that that was all for my good and for my future pleasure. And this, in turn, brought him pleasure as my father. Likewise, our Heavenly Father is pleased with his children when we say, Look, God, I have not been perfect. I have messed up, and I have failed at being holy like you want me to be. But I really do want to please you. That's what pleases God. And if we as a church can have that heart just saying, God, we want to please you. And if your word says it, we'll believe it. Whatever you ask us to do, God, we want to please you. Sure, we're going to fail, but we want to please you. I love this church for a lot of surface pleasing reasons, but I love this church most because I believe the things we believe most in this church please our Heavenly Father. I believe believing that we have a perfect word of God pleases our Father. I believe this book right here is the perfect, without error, does not need improving on, does not need a better translation, is the perfect word of God. And we can go and we can open this book and we can have a final authority. If I came up here today and I pulled out my King James Bible and then I pulled out my NIV and then I pulled out my uh, New Age uh, Living Translation and I said, I said, you know what, God, he wants us to love the church over here but he also uh, uh, wants something else over here, and, and, uh, and he, maybe he says it differently over here, and, and I go to all my translations, then you as the church are believing whatever I think should have been translated and should have been said in God's word. But it's not, you're, it's not a pastor that is, that is saying uh, this is what the Bible says. It's the word of God that says what God wants. And the pastor is just supposed to preach what God's word says and say this is what God says. And like it or not, it's not about what I'm saying. It's about what God is saying. And this is how you can apply it to your life. And Jesus said, or the Bible says that he manifests his word through preaching. He makes it plain. He makes it clear through preaching. We've got to have God's word. I believe believing in a perfect word of God pleases our Heavenly Father because the Bible claims to be the perfect word of God. And so if the Bible is not the perfect word of God, then the Bible is a liar. And if it lies one time, then can it lie a bunch more times? But it can't. The God who cannot lie wrote this book, and we can put all of our faith in it. But that the scary part about that and the reason that nobody wants to believe that anymore is because when you put your faith in God's word and believe it for what it says, then we've got to do what it says. And that, that scares people. I believe believing in salvation pleases our Heavenly Father. Our church is very strong on the scriptures. Our church is very strong on soul winning. I think sal salvation, I got saved right here in this back parking lot as, as a nine-year-old boy. I bowed my head believing I was a sinner and I put my faith in Jesus alone to save me from my sins and that from that day on, I wrote it in my book, uh, in my Bible that I was saved on August 24, 2002 and that was, that was my day of salvation. Do you have a day of salvation? You don't need to remember the day 
date, but can you remember the time or the, the, the place? Can you remember the instances around that time? And if you can't remember that time, then you won't have the assurance that you need to go boldly proclaim the gospel to your friend down the street, to go talk about him. You've got to have salvation settled in your heart. And salvation is a big part of our church. We believe in souls being saved. We believe salvation is so vitally important. Uh, the, the people who got saved yesterday and then the, the person I heard of t this morning that has already been saved, you can be saved today and salvation can change your eternal destiny from hell to heaven. It could change you from being, being a, a child of this world to a child of the king. Salvation is so, so important. I had a young man on my bus route a couple months ago. He was riding his dirt bike down the road and, uh, and it was a blind corner and a car was, was, was speeding through. This car didn't have a stop, had, didn't have a stop sign, so it was the, the dirt bike's fault. But he was, he was crossing through a, a, a stop sign and, and didn't see the car. The car didn't see him and, and crashed right into him and killed him. I am so thankful that I got to go to his family and say, your son trusted Christ in the back seat of my car on the way to a Wednesday teen activity. He put his faith in Christ and he now has his eternal life secured in heaven. We believe in salvation, and I believe that pleases the Father. Uh, you, just looking at the things that were important to God, he said, my words are important. He said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He, he came here uh, uh, to seek out lost souls, and, uh, and, and I'm taking too much time on the things that we believe that please God, but I believe that soul winning pleases God. I believe that giving towards missions, we just had that missions conference, reaching the world, the lost world who doesn't know Christ's name. Uh, reaching them with the gospel is important and, and pleases God. I believe our ministries here at Faith Baptist Church please God. And you can be a part of a ministry here. You can sing in this choir. I believe when you sing in the choir, that pleases God. You can, you can vacuum and, and take care of his house. I believe that pleases God. You can put on a red usher's jacket and you can greet people and be a welcoming face as people come in to the doors here at church. I believe that pleases God. You could, join, you could come out with us on Saturday mornings and, or Thursday evenings and you could go out and you could pass out tracks and tell them, hey, there's verses on the back of that track. A track is a, a little paper talking about our church. There's verses on the back there that tell you how the Bible says you can know for sure you're going to heaven. You could join a bus route and you could go out with us and you could visit in the homes of these, these, uh, these kids who, who just have just messed up lives and these, these, you meet the parents of, and, and try to encourage them to come to church and be a part of a ministry here you could, you could help in the rest homes or help in the jails. and the, the ministries are just endless on the things that you could do to please God here at this church. We believe in separation from the world, and I believe that pleases God. If we just tried to fit in with the world, then we would be going against what this book asks us to do. We have got to be a separate people from the world. There's got to be something different in us. So what should be different in us? And that's what this book clearly spells out on what should be different in our life. We should not blend in the same as our unsaved co-workers at work. Something should be different about us. We should not be out in the deserts riding dirt bikes on Sunday mornings like the, the unsaved crowd. We should be different. We've got to be separate. We've got to be separate in what we listen to. We've got to be separate in the TV shows that we watch with the cursings and and the nudity and all of the junk that's uh, that's pouring into our life we've got to be separate we're different and I believe that that pleases God I believe that a happy Bible believing home pleases God our church believes that you can have a happy, successful home that loves each other, that has kids that aren't a holy terror to society, that has kids that actually want to obey, that have kids that, that grow up and love their parents. And you as parents, you, you love your kids and, 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 and that continues into adulthood and, and, uh, and, and beyond and into grandkids. And, and we've got an incredible thing. Uh, thing here at this church and it's not because this church is all that it's just this church has decided if it's right here we believe it 
this is our recipe. This, we're not going to try to improve on it. We're not going to try to change it. These are the instructions, and so we believe it. You keep coming to church, and you're going to hear things about your home that's going to that's gonna kind of bristle you on the inside. I don't know if that's how we're supposed to, to handle our kids. The Bible's very clear on how we're supposed to handle our kids. The Bible's very clear on how we're supposed to love our, our, our spouse. The Bible's very clear on how uh, the time that we're supposed to invest in the, and the, the prayer that's supposed to be put into it and the discipline that's supposed to go into a happy, successful home. All of those things, I believe, are things that we believe, and there's more, believe that please God. Now, do you still have Matthew chapter 13? Pleasing God has got to be the most important thing in our life. In this story, the story says in Matthew 13, verse 45, and again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant, man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The merchant in this story, I would like to compare him to you and me. The merchant's he, he, his, he, what he was doing was seeking goodly pearls. He was seeking things that brought him value. And in this world, we are seeking things that bring us value. We are seeking happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. But a lot of times, there's, the merchants in this world are seeking happiness in the wrong places. They're being, get, finding uh, uh, happiness that doesn't really bring them the happiness that God promises. They're seeking peace. You're seeking goodly pearls. They're just, they're really beautiful. They're neat pearls. There's neat little nuggets of, of, of things out in this world uh, uh, that, that you could be, be searching for. Maybe you're just searching church to church. Maybe we're just one of the lists of churches that you're trying here today. Um, and you're searching. You're searching for goodly pearls. You want the happiness. You want the peace. You want the fulfillment in life. You want the purpose. Why are we even here? What is the purpose? How can I, how can I uh, get my life to be a successful life? And we're looking for those goodly pearls. But this world has a lot of false pearls to give you. This world has a lot of artificial pearls uh, out there. Um, a lot of people, they'll find their happiness in who's going to win the Super Bowl this next week. Um, and uh, obviously, in, any of you other fans uh, do, did not find your happiness in that. Um, but uh, maybe it's a new car that you think will bring you happiness or peace. Um, maybe it's a new job that will bring you purpose, you think. Maybe it's an attractive uh, boy or girl teenagers that you think, they're going to bring me happiness. They're going to bring me uh, that, that peace that I want. Maybe it's the popularity on a, on a social media site, and you want, you want all the followers, and you want all of the, 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 uh, the fame that's being so pushed uh, right now in society. And, and you're looking for things that will please you they're goodly pearls in our mind but the neat thing is in this story the merchant did something unusual his search was halted because he had found a pearl like no other he was searching for goodly pearls and then all of a sudden he said that's it I'm done that's the one I want that's the pearl I'm looking for he heard the great price given and probably his heart stopped for a second saying, oh, man. And he considered it for a moment, but then suddenly none of his previous merchandise mattered anymore. None of his earthly possessions compared to the value of this gem. And he did what no merchant who is wise according to this world should do because he, he went. He began to spend his all on this one pearl of great price. He began to sell things that used to hold value in his life but no longer. He began to sell things that before today he would have never imagined selling. He began to give up pleasures that he would have never imagined giving up before. I can imagine his concerned peers came up to him asking, what's so special about this pearl? I can picture his self-righteous friends coming up to him asking, what's so special about this pearl? Why is this so important to you? Why is this pearl such a priority in your life? And just in my imagination, I could picture the merchant saying, because I received an invitation to appear before the king soon. And when I saw this pearl, I knew that through this great pearl, I can please the king. 
This is a king's jewel. No one else deserves this jewel. Nothing I have matters anymore. I can sell all that I have because if I could buy this pearl, if I could acquire this pearl, then I could bring this pearl and present it to the king and say, this is for you, O king. Thank you for what you did for me. He's been so good to me. What you don't know is I was born without name or status. This is the merchant talking. I was born in poverty and rags. I grew up a thief and a liar, but one day the king adopted me into his royal family. He made me one of his own and he gave me everything that I have of value that I needed. But since then, I've gone my own way and become a merchant. And I've seen all kinds of pearls that, could have, that pleased me and that could have pleased any number of kings. I've seen all kinds of options out there. But this pearl, this pearl would please the king who saved me from my lost ways. Giving up whatever it takes to get this pearl is worth all to please my king. Up until now, my life has been spent to make money, to build wealth to please myself, to please my friends, to please my peers. But now I realize the greatest honor, the greatest purpose, the greatest joy, the greatest happiness, and the greatest fulfillment. Yes, the greatest honor of my life would be to please my king. I'm buying this pearl because I want to give it to him when I stand before him. I want to stand before him one day and say, I spent all that I had to give this to you. I'm challenging us today to buy this pearl of a church. You say, you say what are you talking about? Are you saying I should go and uh, sell my home and, and, uh, and, and sell my cars and sell, uh, give all my money and just live on the streets? No, that's not what the Bible's asking. Well, the Bible says we're not supposed to stop providing for our family. If we stop providing for our family, we're worse than an unbeliever. So you've got to keep providing for your family. Or does that mean that you're supposed to stop working? Uh, uh, no, because, because uh, when we stop working, the Bible says we shouldn't even eat if we're not somebody who has a, uh, has a job, who's, who's a worker. Um, we've got to be uh, a working people. We've got to provide for our family. Um, are we supposed to give all of our money to the church? No, that's not what God is asking. He does say 10% because that's his, according to the Bible. Um, he does say that we're supposed to honor the Lord with our substance and the first fruits of our increase. And, uh, and he does say that we're supposed to give as we, as, as we purpose in our heart. It's between us and God. Uh, but, but money is not what I'm talking about. But when you can consider, hey, everything I have actually belongs to the king and is because of the king. And you could go to your life and say, what? Do I need to give up? What do I need to spend or what do I need to sell in my life? And I'm not even talking financially, but just to move out of my life that's keeping me from buying into this pearl of a church. Because work on Sundays, and I'm not, I'm not here to, to bag on you if you're working. You got to provide, but you got to consider is this keeping me from the thing that God has placed such a value on? Uh, football on Sundays or just hobbies or, or just tired. What is keeping you from not seeing or not purchasing the value or selling something in your life to be able to buy into the value of this pearl. I'm challenging us today to buy into this pearl of our church with our time, with our attention, also with our money, with our, our talents, the things that, we're, that, that we can do, our, our abilities. I mean, uh, you say, well, I can't sing or I can't, I don't have a lot of talents. Uh, hey, you can open your eyes and you can move your feet and fingers and you can, you're a body. You can be a part of this church. You have talent. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to present something to him. And I can't wait to hold up this pearl of a church where I spent my time and my resources in my life, where I placed such a high value on in my life and I made it a priority in my life and it was, it was the most important thing of my week was this pearl of a church and say this, what I did at this church, this is for you, O oh king, for what you did for me because I knew you would value this pearl. And one day, if we continue in this analogy, if God were to ask me, Matt, what did you find so special about this pearl? 
I will be able to say because it's the one I believe would please you best in my life. It's the pearl I found by reading your word and about your desires. It's the one I believe you would see the greatest value in in my life. By lifting up this church in priority in my life, I thought about you more. And after studying about the things you desired, it excited me to work harder as a Christian for you. It made me a better representative of you. It redirected my course from living for myself to now living for you. After all, you deserve everything I could offer. The purpose of this sermon today is because I fear that if we, the body of this church, do not see the great value in this church, and if we are not willing to pay the great price to buy it, if we're not willing to give ourselves in a biblical love the way Christ showed us to love, then we may be outbid by the merchants of this world who see a different value in a church like this, who would love to parade this pearl as a trophy that can no longer be presented to the king. Or, because I fear you, the individual, may miss out on your opportunity to spend your gifts on a gem worthy to present the king because you sit here today and disagree with its value. Let's go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to challenge you to kindle your love for the church today. Will you give up whatever it takes to buy into the value of this church in your life? The message is this. If I'm going to love the church the way God wants me to, I'm going to have to give more of myself. I'm going to have to give up whatever's keeping me from buying into this church. If I'm going to value this church the way God wants me to, I need to see the church the way God sees it. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you move in our hearts. Help us to value this church like you value it. Help it not to be the value that America has put on the church, but help us to see the value you put on the church Help us to re-examine our lives and ask ourselves the question, am I valuing the church like I should? What do I have that's keeping me from the ability to buy into this church, to be able to uh, attend more at this church, but to be able to serve more, to be able to give more of my time, my talents, and my treasures? What is stopping me? Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts, Lord, and show us that thing, Lord, and help us to be the type of church that says, Lord, we want to please you, and then we're going to do the hard part and do whatever you ask us to do. Let's all stand. The instruments are going to pray. If you'd like to get something right in your heart, the altar is open. If there's something in the way, and maybe you, you don't even know how you're going to give it up. Ask God if he'll help you. Ask God if he'll help you to be able to go through with giving it up. And if you, you're still hanging on to it, maybe ask God to, to show you more of the value that is the church. Just meditate on what he purchased with his blood. Where else are you going to find a church that strives so hard to please God? And there's other churches. I'm not saying we're the only ones. I'm just saying we do want to please God. And you are a part of this church, but are you going to buy into this church? If you're not saved today, today has got to be the day. I talked about salvation Today can be the day where your eternity is settled. There has to be a time in each of our lives when we settle that eternity. You will never have the boldness that you need to grow as a Christian if you do not have eternity settled. But worst of all, if you don't have eternity settled in your heart, you're on your way to hell according to the Bible. Because sin, the only thing that sin could get, the best thing that sin could get, deserve is hell but God loves us so much and while we're yet sinners Christ died for us and you can get that settled today 
You could talk to anybody that you know here at church and get that settled. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you help us to be a church that wants to please you individually. We're, our church is made up of every individual life in here. We all are part of the body and we all have to do what we can to express the pleasure of the mind that indwells us. We want to have the mind of Christ. And if we as an individual are not doing what the mind of this church wants, then we're not fulfilling our role in the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that you help us to see the value in the church and to do our part into making this church successful and to do our part into pleasing you by serving through this church. Lord, I sure do love you, and I pray that you be with the rest of our day. Thank you for the individuals who are here today, and thank you for this church body that it makes up. We sure do need you, and we love you. In your name I pray, amen. All right. Thank you for being here, and I think that's all I have. You guys are dismissed. Don't forget to get your tickets in the back, and uh, the girls will be right there in the back taking tickets and, and money. It will be a fun time, and uh, make sure you get those on your way out.